uh, during one of the shows, we did the opening night, and we got a decent review somewhere, Guardian Independent, that we the only papers who took any notice of us at all. Um, but they said, you know, where, what happened to the biting satire, and the Jeremy Thorpe trial was on, I think, or just finished. And Peter went right home that afternoon and wrote a piece. In 1979, the Liberal leader, Jeremy Thorpe, made headlines in a libel suit involving a man called Norman Scott. Scott's case was that Thorpe had hired a hitman to murder him, but Scott's dog was shot instead. Millions followed every revelation. When it came to court, Norman Scott announced to an astonished judge in an astonished press gallery uh, that he had been the lover of Jeremy Thorpe, the uh, splendid, dashing old Etonian leader of the Liberal Party, who was um, married to the ex-wife of the Earl of Harwood, the Queen's cousin, and was as um, fabulously establishment as you can get, and there had been no hint that had reached the public's ears that Jeremy Thorpe might not be as other girls. Uh, and this rather hysterical figure, Norman Scott, claimed that it was a plot to have him killed because he might tell the world that he was Jeremy Thorpe's lover. And it all went to trial. Um, um, Jeremy Thorpe sued and, uh, and so on. The trial ended with the judge advising the jury to return a verdict of not guilty and thereby clearing Thorpe's name. The judge had come out with this outrageously biased um, direction to the jury about how they ought to vote. And Peter had written this, uh, this, this sketch um, and performed it that night. And it was really like kind of live theatre, live comment on something political that was actually happening uh, that day. In the last few weeks, we all heard some pretty extraordinary allegations being made about one of the prettiest, about one of the most distinguished politicians <laughs> ever to rise to high office in this country, or not. <laughs> Over the evidence of the so-called hitman, Mr. Olivia Newton-John, <laughs> I prefer to draw a discreet veil. He is, as we know, a man with a criminal past, but no criminal future. Oh, oh. He's a piece of audio, a piece of excrement, unable to carry out a simple murder plot. without cocking the whole thing up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are now to retire. Yes, indeed, should I. <laughs> you are now to retire carefully to consider your verdict of not guilty. <laughs> And, of course, uh, looking back at that uh, uh, piece, the ridicule that Peter was heaping on this judge's biased summing up in, in favour of a politician, it still seems relevant in the wake of the Hutton report. The sketch became such a hit, it was immediately published in Private Eye and even released as a single. It's just fantastic how judges still have this extraordinary propensity to believe someone because they have an old Italian tie, because they're a peer of the realm, or because they are the power, the establishment. And, um, uh, of course, apart from anything else, it uh, introduced to the world fantastic um, epithets and uh, euphemisms for, for uh, acts of gay love. I remember Peter said to us just before he went on, I just want one more euphemism for uh, homosexual. I got them all, any new ones, and we all sort of tried them all. And then Billy Connolly came up and said, well, in, in, in Glasgow, there's a, there is a phrase called the, uh, the player of the pink oboe. And, bomb, it was time for the sketch to go. Peter goes on, and halfway through it... We have been forced to listen to the testimony of Mr Norma St. John Scott. <laughs> the 
Sandra, parasite, pervert, a worm, a self-confessed player of the pink oboe. And Peter, in the time you got from, from the wings to the sketch, had thrown in self-confessed, <laughs> which I thought really made Claire of the pink oboe work. Quite, quite. Into this dazzling lineup came newcomer Rowan Atkinson. I know I needed, as soon as I walked on, was just to look and take control of the audience. Ainsley. <laughs> and just say, you know, you may not know what I'm, I'm about, but what I'm going to try and do is I'm just going to assume this role of this sardonic, sarcastic and sadistic schoolmaster and I'm going to try and stick to that characterization until the end of the sketch. Ellsworth Beast Major. <laughs> Ellsworth Beast <Yeah>! Minor. <laughs> I have a detention book. <laughs> Hemoglobin. If the audience knows you and knows that you're funny, they'll laugh almost at whatever you do. If you are John Cleese, you can come on and you just go, right, like that, and the audience starts laughing, because it's John Cleese, and all their expectations are there. But if they've never seen you before, it's so much harder. Nancy boy Potter. <laughs> no one really knew who I was or what I did. They were sort of educated. <laughs> in those three, four spots throughout the evening. And the schoolmaster, I think, was the first thing uh, uh, that I did, which kind of said, well, here I am, and this is the kind of thing I do. If I see it once more, this period plectrum, I shall have to tweak you. <laughs> do you have a solicitor, plectrum? <laughs> You're lying, Plectrum, so I shall tweak you anyway. <laughs> See me afterwards to be tweaked. Yes, isn't life tragic? I'm not sure you could, you know, so successfully write or perform a sketch like that now. I think maybe since, you know, corporal punishment was stopped in schools, those sort of characters <laughs> sort of slipped out of favour in comedy terms. <laughs> because, because yet again, you know, the, you know, the character landscape has changed so much you know headmasters are very different now they're far less sadistic don't snigger babcock it's not that funny antony and cleopatra is not a funny play if shakespeare had meant it to be funny he would have put a joke in it 